right, this is another lecture on uh, Texas history, and we continue our march through geography of Texas with local anecdotes, uh, particularly that pertain to people or events uh, on various rivers and geographical formations. Right now, we are continuing with our look and uh, discussion on Lyndon Johnson and in his impact upon the hill country of Texas. Uh, and his interaction with Texas history in the 20th century. As I said in the previous lecture, Johnson is one of the most important individuals in Texas history, particularly in the 20th century. And so I felt find it uh, important to bring him up and to put him in the proper context to hit with him and his neighbors. So anyways, as we left off with Lyndon Johnson, uh, we had basically gotten him into the uh, Congress as a form of an aide or a page, uh, living in those, uh, that uh, boarding house for that brief period of time early in his life when he was a poor young man, uh, and then uh, and I talked about the uh, taking that eight or nine showers uh, that first morning so he could get to meet people and know them. Johnson's uh, political career really takes off in the Congress, and that's if you wanted to, if you had to press me and say where was he the best at, what was he the best at as a politician, uh, he was clearly at times a powerful president, but yet at the same time he was uh, probably not well suited to that job compared to some other men who have held the, the presidential chair. Johnson's uh, career, I think, was best suited probably for the Senate majority or for the United States Senate, uh, and it was there that he was able to exercise the most power because he had uh, just an uncanny ability to know people. And uh, Johnson's methods were varied. Uh, that's uh, really true when you talk about getting to know people. That's really true about all of the uh, individuals uh, who are really good at the craft of uh, politics or good at the art of politics. I, I know today some of you maybe even have thought about getting a degree in political science. And uh, yes, there is some science to it in a modern sense. You've got numbers and statistics and so forth. Uh, but I think like, uh, like baseball, and of course I'm a baseball fan, uh, like baseball and statistics uh, and analytics and so forth, people saying you need to do this, you don't need to do that, uh, and they, the numbers bear it out. I think you can take the human factor out of baseball and it becomes almost joyless and lifeless at times. Uh, sometimes it feels like a baseball game today in 2020, uh, even without the pandemic. It was true last year in 2019. It's sometimes joyless in the sense that it's everything's uh, by code or by algorithm or whatever. The same can be said for politics, that if you, all you do is look at the numbers and just crunch numbers, and they can, numbers can tell you a lot, uh, but there are times that uh, you need as a human being, as a politician, to be able to feel the ground and just have this innate ability to read, and the great ones have it, read what the, the, the tone and temper of the country is as president, or maybe when you're running for president, to know what, a, uh, what you need to do in a specific area, how you need to address the people, and so on. Uh, I would make that analogous to, uh, say, 2016, and for all, and I'll say this, and you may not like what I'm about to say next, uh, but I, this is my analysis, is, is that for all the faults of President Trump, and he's got them, the fact of the matter was he was a better politician, uh, by far arguably, I would say, than was Hillary Clinton in 2016. Uh, and it makes me think of, and maybe it wasn't that Trump was that good of a politician, I think think there is something to his ability at that time to harness people to vote for him and get them to vote for him. But I think there were a lot of folks who also voted against Hillary by voting for Trump. I think that's fair to say. But really where I'm going with this is that I think uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign, and to that matter the candidate herself, was frankly a bad candidate. And she also had, um, she had a lot of folks who crunched a whole lot of numbers. But on her, I'll say on her staff, and I don't mean this literally like in a paid position, but obviously who would, at least you would think, in, uh, influence uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign for president would be the former president, Bill Clinton, uh, whom I think is one of the great politicians in the history of the United States. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, was, uh, had that feel, like I'm talking about, like Lyndon Johnson had that feel. Andrew Jackson had that feel for what the country looked for. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt certainly had it, and there have been others as well who've been presidents. And I think Lyndon Johnson had the feel of a politician, a great politician. But anyways, to finish the stuff on Clinton was is that uh, Bill Clinton basically said, you're missing the boat and you're taking Wisconsin and Michigan and the old labor boys and the labor, uh, labor faction of the Democratic coalition, at least the, the not the 
public, uh, not public labor unions like um, uh, who work for the government, but I'm talking about private labor unions like uh, the AFL-CIO, uh, various brotherhoods that are pipe fitters or electrical workers or what have you, uh, that they, were, they, the Democrats in 2016, were taking them for granted and that Trump was speaking to them. Uh, and a lot of folks who said in the Clinton campaign, a lot of the uh, numbers boys said, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, uh, we, we, the numbers speak to us and we're fine. Problem was is that, well, Bill Clinton was right, and the reason Trump won and he lost the popular vote, as we know, statistically by about 3 million votes, the fact is, is that Trump won the Electoral College by winning Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, those big uh, old Rust Belt, as they called, uh, old labor states that still have labor unions that uh, voted for Trump in large enough numbers, not much, but large enough numbers for him to carry the Electoral College. Uh, so I think there is something to be said for having a feel. And Johnson had that. He had that feel of the, of the population. He had that feel of the, of the country, uh, and especially in the United States Senate, bringing it to a closer thing. Uh, in the United States Senate, you've got 100 people, and, and he could uh, feel it out. But he was uh, a master politician. I'll explain more about the Johnson treatment as we go. But when we say Lyndon Johnson was a master politician, uh, something else to remember too, and this is a hallmark of the great ones for the most part. Uh, you saw it with Bill Clinton. You saw it with Franklin Roosevelt. You saw it with Jackson. Is, is that if you became his friend or supporter and you continued to support him, not necessarily slavishly, uh, not necessarily like a sycophant or anything like that, uh, but at the same time, but if you supported him uh, and you stayed more or less loyal and true, I mean, understanding there might be this thing where you just can't vote, and, and the, the good politicians in the American sense know that there are times you have to break, but there are times also you have to demand the loyalty on a major issue. It's not complete loyalty, but mostly loyalty. Well, anyways, all that to say is, is that uh, Johnson never forgot his friends. For it, whether, and to say this more particularly, even when he became the Senate Majority Leader, which is one of the most powerful individuals in the government and in the United States in, ni in the 1950s or in 2020, or even when he became president, but especially when he became, uh, uh, you know, he was uh, moving up the ladder, he never forgot his friends. An story that I'm about to tell to you and, and, of course, record for, I guess, posterity at this point and go on Google and probably be buried in some uh, server somewhere, even if I ever erased all these uh, things off of YouTube. The fact of the matter is, is that, uh, I guess you can see, uh, I don't believe there's anything that is unsaid nowadays. All that to say, however, is, is that when it comes to uh, these uh, this, this great politician, and I, I, I'm ambivalent at best about Lyndon Johnson. I actually don't care that much for him. But all of which to say is, is that uh, when you talk about Johnson, uh, in 1959, it may have been 1958, Lyndon Johnson came to Snook. I say Snook, but it was really in the Brazos River bottom. Uh, and he went down to uh, the Baker Plantation, the Baker Farm. Uh, I might have referenced a fellow named Bobby Baker in an earlier lecture. Um, it's, there's no relation to my knowledge between the Baker pl uh, Farm and the Bobby Baker that I referenced earlier. Uh, those, those two Bakers are two separate individuals. Baker is a common last name. But anyways, uh, the Baker Farm, uh, the Baker Plantation, and the Brazos River Bottom over the years has been a big, and it's, it's no longer there, but it used to be a big family uh, plantation plantation that goes back at least to the early 20th century, and if I had to guess, goes into the late 19th century somewhere. Anyways, uh, in the 1930s, when Lyndon Johnson became a congressman, about 1938 or so, when Johnson became a, a congressman, his district included Burleson County. And when you talk about Lyndon Johnson, the congressman, you think of Johnson as a congressman that is uh, in the Hill Country, and the majority of his district was in the Hill Country, uh, out around Johnson City and so forth. But yet it's extended all the way to Burleson County. It was just like a, it was an elongated district, something akin to what uh, the state of Tennessee looks like. Well, anyways, uh, that all to say is, is that the Bakers were some of his biggest supporters, and they would uh, give him money. Politicians need money, and some people have said over the years kind of uh, sarcastically but also truthfully that money is the mother's milk of politics. And even to this day, you see that in forms and fashions, uh, the desire to raise money, the need to raise money so you can buy ads or this or that or steal it in some cases, it seems like. Uh, but at the same time is, is that uh, money is just part of the deal in playing politics, and Johnson got it. 
and they'd always given him some money. Now, as Johnson's career goes on, they become smaller and smaller campaign contributors. There's others who will give massive amounts of money to Johnson, much more so than this Baker, uh, these Baker uh, people, uh, the Baker family, excuse me, and the, their friends there in the Brazos River Bottom and Burleson and Brazos counties. But Johnson never forgot them. And the story I'm about to tell you, it's, it kind of gets to several things about Johnson's uh, proclivities for drinking, excess, uh, remembering his friends, all those sorts of things there. It was told to me by a now, man now deceased by about two, three years, a guy named Lewis Porter. Lewis Porter was at this event, and Porter uh, reported, Lewis Porter was a crop duster, in the, uh, a flying crop duster uh, in the Brazos River Bottom in the late 1950s. And Lewis Porter uh, was never a big man, never important in the sense of like, oh my gosh, you need to remember this guy because history's hinged on this, what Lewis Porter wrote or said, because it's not. I mean, that's, this is just a story and an anecdote. But Porter was down in the, at, he got invited to this event, and Johnson would come to these almost every year. Uh, I mean, he, he remembered his friends, even if they weren't the biggest friends anymore. But it was a heck of a thing, uh, and it certainly made that, those people feel good, and they'd tell their friends about it. We were at a party last night at the Baker House, the Baker Plantation, and Lyndon Johnson was there. The Senate Majority Leader was there. The great senator from Texas was there. And, and Johnson, by 1958-59, is certainly said, setting his cap or at least thinking about running for president, uh, and of course he becomes president eventually, but when you talk about Johnson, not only is he thinking about that, you also should consider that Johnson is uh, just a powerful man, and it, you know, there, some people will say, you're, you know, just a, it, when someone talks about, I met a great individual or a power, VIP, uh, some f people will be turned off by it, but you know as well as I do, the more, I would argue, uh, far more will say, oh, tell me more, oh, that's interesting, let me know, whether, it, whether it's a politician or a celebrity or somebody else uh, that's there. So anyways, Johnson was at this party. It's in April of 1959, I believe. Uh, it, was, it was in April, I know that, but it was either 58 or 59. And Johnson uh, was there, and it's a uh, Lewis Porter could be a, a kind of a cynical, sarcastic individual, and I'm quoting him when he called it a, a weenie boiling. Uh, now, obviously, they're not going to just have they're not having hot dogs for the Senate Majority Leader. This ain't a, a little league game. Uh, but uh, the thing is, is that they had barbecue, they had beer, they had cold, other cold drinks, as my grandmother used to call them, and, and on. It was a blowout. You, you pull out the best for Johnson, and you raise money for Johnson, and you give him a check. Uh, but Johnson was there, and he could, Johnson, especially when he wanted something, the money, and, and he had friends. I, I don't make it sound like he didn't have friends in that crowd. He could be very sociable, and Johnson drank. Uh, sometimes he drank to excess, and I might have even mentioned in a previous lecture that he had a heart attack, and it nearly killed him. Uh, this is before this weenie boiling that Porter relayed the story about. But Johnson was there, and he was drinking, and he got drunk, and he passed out, um, and Johnson uh, ended up basically face down in the mud or face down in the yard there at the, at the Baker Plantation. But this wasn't the first time Johnson had ever gotten uh, blitzed and passed out. Maybe it was not even the first time there at Snook in that, or that, in that Brazos River bottom. And so people just kind of said, ah, Lyndon will lay in the yard, he'll be okay. And, you know, we'll go inside and play dice, throw, uh, play cards. I mean, this is, these are a bunch of men. I, I don't know if there was anybody else there other than a bunch of men and politicians and so forth. Uh, maybe there was a wife or two there, but I kind of doubt it back in that era uh, to my no hearing of the story. But as you well know, in April, sometimes Texas gets some nasty weather. Thunderstorm came up, and Johnson, about midnight, is still passed out in the yard. This is the Senate Majority Leader, and in a few years, the Vice President, and just a few years after that, the President of the United States. A powerful man passed out in the yard, uh, blitzed and uh, drunk. So the way uh, Porter told the story is, is that a thunderstorm came up around midnight, and he and a, uh, one other guy were, they said, go get, the, go get Lyndon and bring him in the house. He's going to get rained on. We don't want him to get mad. And so Johnson, who was, who was out, blacked out basically, I guess, was picked up by the arms and legs by Porter and another fella. And uh, they drug him into the house and got him out of the rain. 
But, I mean, it, it, it gets to several things when I tell that story. Johnson's excesses, it talks about uh, also Johnson's uh, fidelity in a, in a political sort of way, fidelity to his friends. He never forgot them. Uh, and even that still is, is that later on, Johnson will help, help uh, build uh, a, a lake around this area. Uh, lake Somerville was built by, essentially, Johnson pulling money from here and there to get uh, the Federal Corps of, Army Corps of Engineers to build Lake Somerville as a flood control project. And also, by the way, uh, it doesn't hurt to have the ability to the, the launch a boat in it and go swimming and fishing and so on at Lake Somerville. Anyways, Johnson uh, has that uh, aspect to him. So he's earthy. Uh, he's a heck of a mimic, they always said about him. A great storyteller, uh, crude. Uh, but in 1938, he's going to run for uh, the congressional se uh, seat uh, in, that I just referenced there in the Hill Country, extending into central Texas. What had happened was uh, the predece his predecessor uh, died, and uh, the predecessor's wife basically wanted the seat uh, gratis. She wanted it free of charge, meaning basically, I'll, I'll run for this as long as I don't actually have to run and campaign. And Johnson uh, was advised by his father, Sam, uh, and Johnson at times will have a, uh, a bit of, um, of angst with his father. It was kind of an odd relationship, frankly. Um, you know, he didn't want to be like his father, but he did respect his father. It's, it was kind of a dance that some of you might do with one of your parents. Uh, you know, there's a, a love-hate relationship there. So anyways, Johnson uh, was told by his father to quit dithering around and declare yourself for that congressional seat. That woman doesn't really want it, meaning he's talking about that uh, dead congressman's wife, says that lady, that woman does not want to actually run for the office. If you declare, she won't do it. And sure enough, Johnson ran and got it. He gave a whole bunch of speeches, passed out, lost an appendix along the route. And basically, one of the things I want you to understand about Lyndon Johnson in the pres in the uh, when running for office, and this is true for all of his uh, campaigns, with maybe one exception in 1960, meaning his presidential bid in 1960. But I want you to understand this, is that when Johnson ran for an office, and especially if he was threatened that he might lose, uh, he ran and ran hard. He did everything in his power to get the office. He, he would give every speech. Uh, it, the, basically, the dictum was, if I do everything, I will win. And it, there is a lot of truth in that statement when you talk about Lyndon Johnson running for office. If I do everything, I will win. And, and it seemed to bear out for him at least. And so in 1938, Lyndon Johnson, to the issue of principles, which he had, and then if he didn't like those, he had others as well at times, uh, he, in 1938, write this down, ran as a New Deal liberal. Now, some of you are familiar with politics, and some of you are familiar with American history in 1302 territory, uh, and you know the New Deal. That's Franklin Roosevelt. In 1938, the, the, the Great Depression was still on. It was in its about 10th or 12th or 15th year, depending on where you lived. Maybe eighth year, I don't know, just depends on where you live. But there were a lot of people who were still hurting. And the New Deal had come in in 1933 with Lyndon Johnson, excuse me, with Lyndon Johnson, with Franklin Roosevelt when he was elected. And uh, it was still going. And so the New Deal uh, was uh, at times recovery, at times relief, at times reform. Uh, and Johnson is going to run as a Roosevelt man. To, to use a different phrase, he lifted high the Roosevelt banner, and he said, I'm a Roosevelt man, and had campaign buttons, which was common back then, that said, me and, uh, me and LBJ for Roosevelt, or excuse me, me and Roosevelt for LBJ. And it was a picture of uh, Johnson tied very closely to Roosevelt. Uh, he ran, I mean, he basically wrapped himself in the Roosevelt banner. Uh, it's analogous today that uh, uh, in this part of the country, in Texas, you will see, and I say this part of Texas, I'm talking about uh, rural and, uh, and semi-rural and smallish, small town Texas and even middle-sized Texas, you will see men and women running for Congress who will wrap themselves in the Trump banner. Uh, that's true. It was, if, you, if I had to guess, if I went up to Illinois, uh, where President, former President Obama's from, or maybe Detroit or Phil parts of Philadelphia and other parts of the country, uh, where it was, uh, it's more likely to find a Democrat or at least to find a competitive race, uh, I wouldn't be surprised you would find people running in the Democratic primary in 2010 or 2014 or so, somewhere in that neighborhood when Obama was president. They wrapped themselves in the Obama banner, and they wrapped themselves in uh, his, his uh, program and such. It's the same sort of thing here. So uh, Johnson did that and got himself elected. 
and Johnson moves to Washington, D.C., and so now he's a congressman, and he, like I said before, and that story about him getting to know people, all those connections start to pay off. He starts to look around for power. Uh, he wants to be on certain committees, uh, some of which are far more important than others in the Congress. If you ever get to the Congress, you want to be on the uh, Ways and Means or the Appropriations Committee, which either tax, and, tax or spend. And if you're a congressman on one of those two committees over the years, you were a very popular person with uh, big business, small business, chamber of commerce, taxpayers, and everybody. Everybody wants to be your friend. And so Johnson in the 1930s is going to uh, cultivate, late 1930s, early 1940s, he is going to cultivate friendships in the Congress, uh, including which is Sam Rayburn. Uh, and I probably ought to sp spend a moment talking about Rayburn uh, now. Sam Rayburn, uh, I, I've, I, I am ambivalent at best on Johnson, as I just said, and most times I actually don't think that highly of him, even though I find him a fascinating character. Uh, I think Johnson was at best a... Uh, a, a average president. But all that to say, though, is, is that uh, I, I think very highly of Sam Rayburn. I, I do not think Sam Rayburn was a saint walking on water. I'm not going to go that way. But uh, Sam Rayburn, born in Tennessee, but spends most of his, uh, or rather grows up in, on the Red River in Texas, up at, uh, close to Bonham on, in Fannin County. And so uh, if you've ever been up that part of the world in Bonham, there is a Sam Rayburn Museum. It's worth your time to go in there for a few hours. Like I said, Rayburn's a good guy. It's, uh, I, I really in, in think highly of him. Uh, Rayburn is the longest-serving Speaker of the House in the history of the United States. That's number one. Number two, uh, when you talk about Rayburn, uh, he was honest. Uh, he was a politician. Like I said, I'm not going to turn him into some sort of, uh, you know, uber-principled uh, saint that uh, walked on water and did nothing wrong and blah, blah, blah. But I think, the, to me, the thing about him compared to Lyndon uh, Johnson is this, is that when Lyndon Johnson died, he went from, when he was a young man, he was a poor man to, as he died, a wealthy man with a legacy of uh, not stealing necessarily from the Treasury, uh, but at the same time dealing himself... Uh, uh, licenses as such for the media aspect, KLBJ, TV stations, and so on, and the Austin and Central Texas community. Uh, Johnson had he purchased land cheap. He so, uh, sold land expensive. He had stock options. He he he. Johnson had a lot of friends, and he made a lot of money. I mean that that's one of the the perks of being a congressman. But to the credit of Sam Rayburn. When Sam Rayburn died in 1961, it may, I think it was, when Rayburn died of um, uh, pancreatic cancer, he was an old man, but it, it got him and took him quick, kind of like it did uh, Lewis recently, John Lewis out of Georgia recently. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, Rayburn, he died with about $1,700 or $1,500 to his name which even in the time period of 1960 and 61 ain't that much money. Uh, he wasn't destitute, but he certainly wasn't wealthy. And the reason I say that is, is that it's, but for a man who serves as Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives for the better part of 20 years, not consecutively, there's some uh, Republican moments in that 20-year in that hitch, and before that majority leader, and had been in public life for all of his adult life, essentially, the fact of the matter was is that he never enriched himself. Now, you, that, I, I think very highly of him for that. He could have easily enriched himself in, the, in that, those offices. A lot of men would have. A lot of women would have. But he didn't. Um, and to Rayburn, to my knowledge, uh, he was, by the way, married uh, briefly for about, about a month, maybe two, uh, and then got divorced, and he never talked about it again. And uh, he may have had a girlfriend here or there, but it was a very private thing. He never talked much about it, and uh, he, was, he was never the, the rank womanizer, bluntly put, that Lyndon Johnson was. But the reason I think highly of Rayburn isn't just on the personal level for the most part or his uh, lack of stealing money or b taking advantage of his position in the Congress, uh, I guess to be more polite about it. The thing is, is that Rayburn, um, as Speaker, advanced some very important pieces of legislation in his time. He was a Democrat. I want to make that clear to you. He was a Democrat. Um, and he was a partisan. Now, the partisanship of the uh, 1950s and 1940s took a different tone than it does today. It's, uh, it's not quite as supercharged as, as, I'm, as 2020 when I'm recording this. 
But the fact was is that Rayburn, when he was speaker, uh, particularly I think of 1940 and 1941, and that's where I think his greatest contribution as speaker would be. It has to do with the coming of World War II and uh, his attempts uh, to prepare the United States for World War II and even something else to consider too, his aid in developing the atomic bomb. But for the coming of World War II, uh, you got to understand in American history, the United States, uh, for the most part, was unprepared for World War II, not unlike being unprepared for World War I. In some ways, arguably, we were worse prepared for the Second World War than we were the First. I don't know that I would argue it, but some have. Uh, but all that to say is, is that we're not ready. And it, when the thing to understand about American history had been up to that point in time, and it's logical for what we do, um, when we fight a war, we are unprepared, uh, haphazard, uh, basically don't know what we're doing. And it's, and I say don't know what we're doing, but we're just not uh, organized at the least. Some people don't know what they're doing and they're incompetent and should never have been put into an office or be an officer. But because you have politics, you get those sorts of things. You see it in the Civil War, you see it in the First World War and on. The issue is, is that uh, we normally get it together and then, then start to uh, re re basically take uh, and, and start to fight much better as the war progresses. That was true in both world wars. But the First World War burned a lot of Americans. There were a lot of Americans by the 1920s and especially the early 1930s who had come to the conclusion that the First World War was a mistake, that we'd wasted the lives of many men, and that they had died unnecessarily uh, fighting for a war for capitalism if you're more of a Marxist type. And understand this, in the 1930s, and in the, er, in the 1930s, there were a lot of folks who looked over at the Soviet Union and said, the future is before us, and it works. I'm actually quoting a man directly when I say that, Lincoln Steffens. But anyways, uh, there were a lot of folks who, even if they weren't Marxist, but looked at the at World War One and said, my boy got maimed, my, li uh, my ch uh, child got killed, or the man speaking about himself directly because those doughboys uh, were basic, were, um, uh, many of them survived the war, said, uh, my li life was ruined because I got gassed and I was never the same. And some of those fellows are going to die at age 45, about my age when I'm at this time, uh, because of their exposure in the World War. And so there was a general negativity, uh, cynicism, it all, you know, basically pessimism with regard to European politics, warfare, the First World War, and by extension, uh, what do we do if another European war breaks out? So, so by the mid-1930s, the United States was so isolationist, and uh, in some respects, it is understandable in my historical opinion. The fact was is that the U.S. Congress in the mid-1930s is going to pass a couple, uh, memory serves there were two of them, but uh, anyways, they were going to pass uh, uh, neutrality or isolationist uh, uh, legislation that basically said that if a war breaks out in Europe, particularly this is looking toward, say, mid about 1935-36, if war breaks out in Europe, the United States is going to stay out of it. We're not going to send our boys once more just so they can get killed for English bankers or German uh, armaments or whatever. Uh, or, or whatever. Just basically, there was very much, some people it's pacifism, others it's isolationism, but it boils out to the same thing. Keep the boys home, let the Europeans kill themselves, and we're not going to get involved. We've walked, we, we put our hands to it once. We're not going to do it again. And uh, Roosevelt at that time period, uh, I don't think he was an isolationist. Uh, Roosevelt comes out of the old Wilson administration. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> whatever you think of uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt was a politician. And like Lyndon Johnson, or Johnson was like Roosevelt. When confronted, uh, Johnson would be confronted later in his life um, <clears throat> when he was a uh, congressman or a senator. They would say, Lyndon, you, you, think, uh, you think there ought to be civil rights legislation. This is before 59. This is before the presidency. And Johnson and, and says, Lyndon, why don't you speak up on behalf of the civil rights movement and, and help, the, help the downtrodden now? In this case, the African-American community. And Johnson would answer back, basically. It's like, it does me no good. It's no good it, to be a uh, principled man or a statesman who can't get elected. And because of that, Johnson uh, chose, uh, I, would, I would say frankly wisely, but he certainly chose when to pick his battles over the issue of civil rights. When Johnson was trying to lose the... Uh, the mantle of the Southern politician so he could run for president. Roosevelt, in the same sort of way, in the mid-1930s, did not fight isolationism all that hard uh, simply because, well, 
you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, glory to be, there was not a lot of power or glory to be gained for standing up for that principle at that time. And so those uh, isolationist uh, b- bills pass the Congress, they go into effect, and the country is standing down. But understand this, of course, uh, Hitler, uh, Adolf Hitler and the, the Nazi socialist or National Socialist of Germany, the Nazis, uh, they are going to take in power in 1933, and by 1936, it's obvious that the Nazis are, at least to some, the Nazis are very much bent on getting into another war. They want to take Germany back to war, and that was Hitler's avowed claim basically from the outset, uh, permanent war footing as he would call it. And, uh, but not everybody uh, saw it, and not everybody, even if they saw it, thought that, that Hitler uh, couldn't be appeased, and that's another lecture for a different class. But in the United States, uh, as you get closer and closer to 1939, on September 1st, and that's the date I'm actually recording this, September 1st, 2020, uh, what was that? Uh, So uh, 80 years, 81 years ago today, uh, Americans woke up uh, to the news uh, that uh, war was, uh, uh, Europe had plunged back into war when Germany invaded Poland uh, on a pretense that was uh, completely false, but Nazis were liars anyway, so what do you expect? Um... But uh, anyways, war descends upon Europe. And a lot of Americans in 1939 were still saying, no, 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 no. We're not going to go to war. We're not going to uh, consume our sons in a, in a European conflict over what we don't, I mean, we, th- we don't think the Nazis are that bad. I, I, when I say that, um, it was not clear to many Americans and even many American leaders in the, early, the late 1930s, say 1939, that the Nazis were going to do what they did. Uh, so what I mean by that is when we think of the concentration camps, and they were clearly there. I mean, Auschwitz, you can go visit it, and that is a, a, a you know, of all the, the acres of God's green earth, uh, there are probably only a handful of places where you can just say there was great evil done here, and there was wickedness done here, uh, and I mean that in the full moral effect, um, uh, and so on. And you say this, this is a haunted uh, wood or a haunted plain. Uh, Auschwitz would be one of those places. There are a few others I could think of. Um, but when we think of the final solution that came out of what's known as the Bonsee Conference in, outside of Berlin in about 1940-41, uh, the final solution of the Jewish question uh, and gypsies and others uh, really doesn't take effect until the early 1940s. Uh, the great gigantic uh, camps like Auschwitz and Buchenwald and others they really don't take the form that we remember them today at, until the early 1940s. Had, were there concentration camps in Germany prior to the final solution of the Wannsee Conference? Yes, of course. There were concentration camps in Germany basically when the Nazis came to power, uh, especially right after the Reichstag fire, and they start rounding, they, the Nazis, start rounding up communist uh, and social democrats and their political enemies. And that's who actually, if you're curious, who do the Nazis go after first uh, in a, co- a concerted sort of way? Uh, who do they try to uh, punish first? Uh, first and foremost, it's the communists because they're consolidating power. But you had concentration camps in Germany uh, during the uh, war, or excuse me, before the war. But the fact of the matter was is that those, uh, I'm, it sounds like I'm chasing a long rabbit, and perhaps I am, but I do want you to get the knowledge of this in the background. So why is what Rayburn doing going to be so uh, principled? Why is it so important? So when it comes to, uh, uh, to the United States, ro- uh, word was getting out of Germany through either official channels or back channels, but it was being reported in various uh, news outlets that uh, Germany was rearming for war, that's number one. And number two, there was the, the Nazis were, uh, you know, evil personified in a sense. Again, not the final solution, but there were camps and there was persecution of Jews and the, uh, the kicking out and the Nuremberg laws and, and so on, the expulsion of Jews and other undesirables, asocials as they would call them too, to get out of the country or they'd put them in the camps. Uh, s- small numbers compared to what will come, but those, it's there. A lot of Americans are going to doubt the truth of those reports, frankly. And the reason being is, is that in World War I, there were, excuse me, there were British or English reports, uh, 
in 1914, 1915, which talked about the uh, rape of Belgium and, and so forth, German atrocities, which after the war you found out was basically or mostly untrue, uh, wildly embellished design and designed to, uh, to inflame American moral passion and bring the Americans into World War I on behalf of the Allies and the English. They were, in a sense, many Americans understood World War I to have been started by a lie or a pack of lies. And so by the time you get to the mid-1930s when the Nazis, who really were as wicked as they were saying and worse, a lot of Americans said, you fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So a lot of Americans said, we don't believe those reports. And so as the 1930s unfold, uh, that isolationism is playing in the background. But it's also fair to say as you get closer to 1939, the outbreak of the war, 1940, um, the, the isolationist position amongst the, the leadership of the United States, the uh, Congress of the United States, uh, military circles, uh, the president himself, of course, uh, is uh, eroding. A lot of folks are abandoning that position and saying, you know what, war is here. We've got to prepare. War is, we, we can't just simply say, a pox on your house, stay away. We can't do that. We can't completely abandon it. That's not to say that you're going to get into the, you're going to go to declare war tomorrow, but uh, if you see the, the neighborhood on fire or you see a roving band of, uh, of marauders, in this case I'm referring to the Germans, of course, uh, you might ought to arm up and get ready just in case the trouble comes to your doorstep. And that was the thinking by the time you get to 1939, especially 1940. Now to the issue of Sam Rayburn. Rayburn, as the uh, Speaker of the House, of course, is going to wield a lot of power. The rules of the House of Representatives in that time period, and even to a certain degree today, allowed the uh, Speaker to rule potentially with an iron fist. If you were a pet of Sam Rayburn, like Lyndon Johnson made himself to be, uh, then you were kind of golden, and you could do not necessarily everything and anything, but you certainly had a lot of sway. And But if you had crossed Rayburn, and this is true for other speakers that predated him, and frankly, if you cross Nancy Pelosi today, she's, she's a, a, a very powerful speaker in her own right then, for a first time around, and probably is, uh, we'll see the uh, history of she's, uh, whether, whether she steps down or dies in the office. Uh, you think that, I don't mean that to be harsh, she's a, she's a 79, 80 year old woman. She's not going to be speaker all that much longer. But she's a very powerful woman in her own right, and some have said she's the most powerful speaker in the history of the country. She controls her caucus, and uh, the House of Representatives is not organized to be a debating society, but to be kind of a pugilistic armed camp territory. And I, I use the word armed, uh, but at the same time, I don't mean that in a, at least not most of the time, a literal uh, fight on the, uh, the floor of the Congress sort of deal. So anyways, uh, when we're talking about uh, Rayburn, uh, the issue before him in 1940 was this. Rayburn, and let me see, let me look up, just take a glance right quick. Oh, do 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 Rayburn in 1940, it was uh, the, uh, it was, well, 1940, Rayburn is going to help push through the Congress. I was trying to see if I uh, get a glance at the date right off the top of my head, but it's 1940 when it is passed. The United States Congress, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, passed a peacetime conscription act, a peacetime draft of men to be in the U.S. Army. And so the United States Army in 1940, prior to the conscription act, was not exactly, it was not, a, not impressive. Uh, it was not a big army. It was one of the, for a developed nation and a powerful economic nation like ours, the U.S. Army was frankly pretty pathetic. Uh, to be clear about this, uh, whereas today, if, for many of you watching this, if you announced to your parents and said, Mom, Dad, I want to become an officer in the U.S. Army or the Marine Corps or the, another branch of service, or Air Force, or uh, out of high school, you announced to them, uh, I wanna, I'm going to join the Marine Corps, your parents uh, might have uh, grumbled a little bit, particularly on the high school, right out of high school side, but a lot of your parents would say, yeah, that's, that's an honorable position, that's okay. The truth is, is that in the 1930s, that was not the position of most, uh, many Americans, maybe most Americans, when it came to their kids uh, desiring to join the Army, especially enlist out of high school. Uh, there was a lot of truth to the issue of uh, you have a choice, join the Marine Corps or go to jail. 
Now, there was a lot of truth in that in that era. Now, a lot of them, uh, Americans would say to their daughters, do not marry a man who is an enlistee into the Army. Uh, it, the view of the, the armed services of the United States in the 1930s was a lot different than it is in 2020. Uh, but all that to say, though, is, is that you need them. you got to have an army. And, you, and the issue was the U.S. Army was too small. It just was not prepared for the war that was frankly coming, that people uh, who had eyes that could see or would see knew that was coming. And so, but in American uh, history and an American mentality, passing a wartime draft, a peacetime draft, is an act of, well, you're breaking with tradition. We, d we have drafts, and we had had drafts. We'd had it twice before in the history of the United States, once in the Civil War, meaning during war, and once during World War I, during that war as well. I'd have to check. I do not uh, think we'd ever had a draft before. I'm certain we didn't. It was just two times. But to institute a peacetime draft, there was no, the war was not declared. Uh, that was considered to be a... a you know, just a, a break with American tradition. Uh, frankly, the idea that you do not want a large army standing around there, that's an old American tradition that's out there, uh, and in a few quarters, still that way today. But anyways, Rayburn and others realized it had to be done. Uh, the Senate would pass it. The, the votes were there, and those, many of those senators, it, it was not overwhelming in the Senate, but it would pass the Senate far easier than the House. Because there were a lot of uh, congressmen, a lot of members of the House of Representatives now, who would uh, take a lot of heat, and they're up for election in 1940. you got to remember that. 1940, the whole House is up. They're all up every two years. And so there are a lot of men, and there are very few women in the House at that point in time, uh, but a lot of men in the House of Representatives might lose their position. And so they're voting not just on the issue of before the nation of shall we have a peacetime draft, but they're voting over the issue of, of and personally, if I vote with this way and vote for a peacetime draft, I very well may, may be voted out of office because I've enraged a lot of my constituents who do not believe either uh, philosophically or isolationist or whatever the reason is, do not believe in a peacetime draft. And so Rayburn was able to get it through and it passed. But bigger still in 1941 was the fact that uh, one of the things Rayburn and the uh, Roosevelt administration and others, the others who shepherded this peacetime draft to the House had to promise to get it done was is that oh, they said basically the expansion of the U.S. Army is going to last only one year. If we, and if after a year we don't need it, we can let it go. And so in order to make the bitter pill easier to swallow in 1940, uh, they included a sunset provision in the in the legislation that said the in 1941 this has this draft has to be reauthorized. You can't just let it keep going uh, in perpetuity. Well, 1941, it's obvious you're closer to war. However, for a lot of congressmen, they felt like they had been promised that the the peacetime draft was a one-year affair and that they wouldn't have to vote on reauthorizing it, especially if you're not at war. Uh, and so it was in some respects in 1941, the reauthorization was far more uh, contentious and far more close, uh, close cut than it was in 1940. Rayburn, through his, the power of his office, the force of his personality, through uh, knowing where levers are, he was a, he was a man who knew the, the mechanics of the House of Representatives. He was a creature, as it were, of the House of Representatives. He pulled every string and he did everything in his power, and he got, and there were some things that were frankly kind of shady, and I don't mean like in a completely, uh, you know, um, breaking bad devious sort of way, but I am saying is he cut some corners to get the vote that he wanted. And if memory serves, the uh, reauthorization of the peacetime draft in 1941 passed by uh, a vote of about 202 to 201 or 203 to 202, but it was a one-vote majority. But one is, more than, uh, one is more than zero, or 202 is more than 201, and in the House of Representatives, majorities work, and Rayburn got it. And the reason that mattered is because had that uh, bill failed and the peacetime draft had been allowed to go away, and more particularly those men who had been drafted into the Army had been allowed to leave, which uh, a lot of them would have, you'd have lost about two-thirds of your uh, drafted men or your enlisted men and about three-quarters of your officers. And so, because remember this, uh, this these dates, of course, here you are in 1941, this is taking place, what happens in December of 1941? 
Of course, it's Pearl Harbor, and we know late after uh, defeating Japan that those plans were on the, on the table already to, to plan out the Pearl Harbor attack. So we're, the war was coming, and it was Rayburn uh, that got us uh, better prepared. I won't say greatly prepared, but certainly better prepared than we were for the, uh, for the Second World War. Uh, if you were to press me and say what was his greatest contribution, I think it's right there. I, I cannot uh, get around that fact. I think that was Sam Rayburn's greatest contribution, uh, and that's what makes him, I think, uh, because sometimes you can live a lifetime, but there is just really uh, one moment in your life that matters more than the, uh, all the others combined. Because uh, sometimes you, I mean, if, especially if you're in a position of leadership some way or another, uh, you could be a county judge or a governor or whatever for 20 years, and all the other stuff is important, kind of, sort of, and some of it, frankly, isn't. Uh, and maybe there wasn't really a lot of uh, pressure. Uh, but when the, hurric the great hurricane comes, you've got to react and get ready. When the, perhaps the riots in the street get going, you've got to be ready to act. So, or in this case, Sam Rayburn, uh, the war was coming and the United States had to get, start getting ready. And that was unpopular. And that's the thing to remember. It's not just that it was a tough thing, but remember, it's unpopular. You also have other pieces of legislation like uh, Lynn Lease and so forth. But really, the, the whole, to me, the crown jewel is that issue about the peacetime draft. But you have other pieces of legislation he was able to shepherd through Congress that helped the, the Allies out, because we're not going to ally with the Germans, that's for certain, uh, and prepare the United States for war. I think that those moments there in 1940 and 41. Uh, are his uh, crowning uh, achievements as a Speaker of the House. Uh, th that's that. I, I will say this also, one other war thing that he helped shepherd through, he and about a half a dozen other members of Congress, meaning senators and uh, House members, uh, knew about, which was the shepherding through and the, uh, the, 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 because remember this, the Congress has the purse strings and the Congress has to pay for everything, or at least should. And so Congress passed a, a series of bills in the early 1940s, about 41, 42 territory and reauthorizations and more money and all that to help fund the Manhattan Project. Uh, the Manhattan Project probably saved uh, the lives of some of your ancestors in the sense that they may have been in the Marines or in the U.S. Army, uh, whether they'd started out in the Pacific or they were in Europe, but they were going to be transferred to Japan. Uh, the United States in, uh, the, in the ward had determined that there was going to be the crushing of Japan, the unconditional surrender of Japan, and that meant we were going to have to invade the home islands. And it was going to be a bloody affair. It was going to be a very nasty affair. Uh, and frankly, a lot of men could write home and say after the bombs were dropped, and frankly, even every year nowadays, we, uh, some people get to wringing their hands over it in August. But every year, uh, excuse me, uh, there were a lot of men who could write home or think back later on and say, you know what, uh, my life was spared. I didn't have to invade the home islands of Japan. Uh, it would have been a nasty affair because it, they, the Japanese were getting very, very good at repelling invasions. Not to say that they could stop us, but it, they'd make it cost and cost very high. So anyways, uh, Rayburn also had a hand in getting that through. Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House, uh, Texan, um, uh, like I said, I guess you could say I, I think very highly of that man. Um, and it was said about him, he was bought, uh, you know, he was Speaker for a few years and the Republicans got into the office, got, uh, took the control of the House in 1946 after the war was over. Uh, and Speaker Rayburn did not have a lot of money and uh, he just frankly didn't even have a car, kind of, sort of, but uh, not a nice one anyways. Uh, a good number of members of the House thought very uh, loved him uh, one way or the other. Some were fearful of him, which also can uh, bring about love, too. Uh, but they bought him a Cadillac, a Fleetwood Cadillac, and it got him a chauffeur to drive him around town because, well, he just wasn't a wealthy man, and they all knew that. Knew he was a good man, and maybe a or at least a great man, and maybe a good man, too, but he, had no, uh, he didn't have the money to just have a chauffeur, and he was kind of, when, when you were the House Minority Leader, you didn't have a lot of perks back then. Something else to remember, too, is, is that because he's from Texas, uh, there was a lot of folks who wanted him to run for president. They thought he would have made a good president. Problem is, is that, well, he was from Texas, and that issue of being a Southerner uh, always hung over his neck. Lyndon Johnson will attach himself to Rayburn, and there's a very famous picture of Rayburn. Rayburn was bald as a cue ball. 
Uh, he balded at an early age. Uh, you can see when he was in his 20s, you can see the hair thinning. And by the time he's about 35, uh, he had no hair. Um, maybe or just made like two or three strands of it or anything like that. But there's a picture of, Ray, uh, of Johnson who's six foot three. He's a big man. And Rayburn's typical for his height for the time. I think about five seven, five eight territory. Rayburn is, is, I think he's sitting and Johnson's standing over top of him. And Rayburn if you, if you saw his face, he looked like he was a man who was about, he was always perpetually pissed off. And, and Rayburn knew that, and he could play that game. Um, and so, uh, but there's a picture, and you can look it up on uh, Google or something like that, where Sam, uh, excuse me, Sam Houston, uh, Lyndon Johnson is kissing Rayburn on top of his head, and, and nobody did that except for Lyndon. And, but Johnson had that ability to attach himself uh, to great men and attach himself to important men more particularly. Maybe they weren't great, but they were certainly important. And, and Johnson played the role of surrogate son to, to Rayburn. So, uh, and Rayburn later on is going to try to help get Johnson elected president and frankly fails uh, at that point. So uh, in the House of Representatives, Lyndon Johnson, to pick the story back up, Lyndon Johnson in the House of Representatives is going to cultivate friends in the industries of Texas. The oil industry, which was uh, uh, coming on the line, really coming into its own in the, at the beginnings of the war, and then, of course, goes beyond that. Uh, but the Great Depression also, because of the New Deal, uh, spent a lot of money building things. So, I mean, I want you to understand this, and you probably need to write it in your notes. One of the, the, the uh, facets of the, uh, the New Deal, uh, you see this throughout Texas to this day. Put this in your notes. I, I kind of already touched on it a little bit with the, uh, the State Fair of Texas. Uh, but throughout Texas, uh, in big cities, small towns, rural villages, and so on, there's going to be a lot of little projects that are built by, the, uh, by New Deal money, by Roosevelt's New Deal money. And Johnson knows this. Small things that he had a he Johnson directly had a hand in building would be say uh, the um, the roadside parks. Uh, many of them are kind of gone into uh, eclipse nowadays, but uh, it was far more common 50 years ago to stop at a roadside park if you're traveling from Houston to San Antonio, or if you're traveling from San Antonio to say San Angelo, which is far more rural, or say San Antonio to the coast. I use San Antonio because I know it so well. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that it was not uncommon for you to pull off on the side of the road. A lot of Americans weren't as wealthy as they were, are today and don't eat out as a course of habit. Uh, you pull off on the side of the road, stretch your legs, let the kid, dog, if you got it uh, with you, go to the bathroom and sit down and crack open the ice chest and drink a Big Red. Uh, especially, you should like Big Red. Big Red is a very good drink, by the way. Uh, and also eat your sandwich or whatever it is. But, you know, it's a roadside picnic, a roadside park. A lot of those were built initially during the Great Depression. And then if you look around and throughout Texas, you will find throughout Texas, not just roadside parks, but uh, little uh, things that, you know, just look odd, uh, little buildings and, and uh, walls and such. For example, right around here at, at uh, Tiny Snook, uh, the, the WPA, Works Progress Administration, built, I think it was Works Progress, it may have been Public Works Administration, built a low uh, red rock wall. I mean, it was just a walkway. It was just uh, designed to be in front of the school. It was nothing impressive, but it gave a, guy, a couple of guys jobs and money to do what they needed to do. Down the road from me is Somerville, and their football stadium and their uh, auditorium that they hold meetings and such in are built by the, uh, the WPA. Caldwell, which is the county seat of Burleson County, where I live, has an a high, old high school gym that's now half condemned that they can't tear down or renovate because, well, it's a PWA project. Uh, and then if you go to Bastrop, Bastrop State Park, that's a PWA project. Heck, um, there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of them out there, and Johnson had a hand in it. But some of the bigger things that are less, uh, I will say less public, but certainly important, and this gets to the issue of the Colorado River, um, the Buchanan Dam. Buchanan Dam on the Colorado, one of the great uh, flood control dams in, in, the, in, the, in the state of Texas, was built by, or helped build, being built by Lyndon Johnson. He's going to not, do, of course, build it himself, but he p helps uh, get it built by uh, funneling New Deal contracts, and Johnson was a master manipulator of money in that sense, funneling New Deal contracts to his friends. Put this name in your notes. Uh, Brown and Root is the name of the company, but uh, George and Herman Brown, George and Herman Brown, for my students who are uh, Houstonians, 
or have gone to a convention in downtown Houston prior to the to the con, uh, the virus outbreak, uh, you should not be surprised to have heard that name before. George the George R. Brown Convention Center. I mean, that's uh, that's a nod to uh, one of the men who helped build modern Houston. If you've ever gone to a football game at Rice University, Rice Stadium, which is actually in its when it was uh, really used, and of course Rice football is nothing compared to what it. Well, it's never been great, uh, but Rice football is uh, inconsequential. It was, it, but w when Rice played A and M in Texas in the old Southwest Conference, people paid attention to Rice University. Now they ask the question: Is they have a football team? Basically, yeah, they do. Uh, but people think of Rice as the great the learning institution, which it is. But Rice Stadium, great place to watch a football game. Really, really beautiful stadium in its prime. Uh, and more particularly, uh, it's a great place to, to see a game. It's just really well laid out. The problem is, is that when you talk about Rice Stadium, or rather it's just kind of, like I said, the university's kind of lost interest in the sport in a sense. Nobody cares. But uh, anyways, where I'm going with this is that uh, that was built by Brown and Root. And they're going to have a lot of projects. Uh, they, Brown and Root, the Brown brothers, George and Herman Brown, are going to have a lot of projects that are going to be uh, funneled to them by Lennon Johnson. And so if you think about it, what's Johnson going to get in return? Well, in the scheme of things, you would call it a political contribution, but it's a form of a kickback uh, that Brown and Root would then turn around and give, or not Brown and Root, directly out of their campaign, but the, the men, uh, George and Herman Brown and their friends would give Johnson campaign contributions. And that allows me to get to 1941. 1941 is, for Lyndon Johnson, one of those watershed moments in his life. And what I mean by that is that 1941, Johnson runs for the United States Senate. The uh, office of the United States Senate, uh, excuse me, one of the Senate uh, ch uh, seats in Texas had opened up. Uh, one of the men had died in the office, and the, so the senator, excuse me, the sitting governor uh, was able to appoint a replacement, and so he re appointed, in quite a fashion, he appointed the uh, the former, or excuse me, the former, how can I say this? Well, he was the hero of Texas, uh, first president of the Republic of Texas, third president of the Republic of Texas, the sword of San Jacinto, as he called himself, and he allowed others to call him that too, at Sam Houston. But he, appoint, he the governor of Texas, appointed Sam Houston's son, Andrew Jackson Houston, who was a decrepit and uh, old man in his dotage, uh, basically appointed him to his, uh, appointed him to the seat. And memory serves, it was his daddy's seat because Sam Houston was one of the first senators uh, from Texas back when Texas joined the U.S. Federal Union. Well, anyways, uh, the man who's going to make that appointment is himself one of the more interesting characters you can come across uh, in Texas history, or I would argue even American history. But uh, saddle, settle in, uh, and we'll pick it up in the next lecture because I'm looking at my counter. It's 56 minutes. I think that's a good place to stop. But this man's name is Wilbert Lee O'Daniel. But nobody called him, or very few people called him Wilbert Lee, or W. they might have called him W. Lee, but everybody knew him in Texas as Pappy O'Daniel. And so we'll talk about the 1941 election, Pappy O'Daniel, and all those sorts of wonderful things in the next uh, lecture. Thank you.